Okay. Welcome to the November 3rd, 2023 meeting of the Arts Commission. The meeting to order the bang of the gavel. <laughs> I have a land acknowledgement as we get started. The city of Boulder acknowledges the city is on the ancestral homeland and unceded territory of indigenous peoples who have traversed, lived in, and stewarded lands in the Boulder Valley since time immemorial. Those indigenous nations include the Apache, Arapaho, Cheyenne, Comanche, Pawnee, Shoshone, Sioux, and the city of Boulder recognizes that those now living and working on these ancestral lands have a responsibility to acknowledge and address the past and must work to build a more just future. All right, with that, we move on to approving our agenda for this retreat. Yes, Matt. Um, Carl Castillo stopped in. He's here a little earlier than expected. So if it's okay, just to respect his time, when he's here, he said he'll come back about 10 o'clock. We could okay. insert his agenda item when he arrives. Okay, sounds good. Uh, we'll work that out. Any other suggested changes to the agenda? Right. Motion to approve. Second. All in favor. Adding to Jack. Sounds good. Great. And approval of the September 2023 meeting minutes. Any discussion there? Any changes? Not seeing any. Do we have a motion? All in favor? Great. All who are not obscene. <laughs> Great. All right. So we're going to move swiftly oh, into. Actually, if we could introduce. Oh, yes. So welcome to the space. So uh, I want to introduce Ali Rhodes, the director of the Park Hey, folks. Uh, and this is before you want me to share. Yeah. I'm not familiar. No, no, no. I have about an hour of material. Always <laughs> <laughs> like the, the joke, not unique, right? No, Matt just invited me to welcome you all to this space and share a little bit about parks and recreation. And I appreciate the opportunity to talk to you all. Thank you for volunteering for our community and making it better through arts. We appreciate your service. Uh, you're here at the South Boulder Recreation Center, which is celebrating its 50th birthday. Uh, in 1973, the North and South Boulder Recreation Centers were built with funding from a cigarette excise tax that was approved by Boulder voters. And the idea was if there was one on both sides of town, everybody would vote for it. And they did, which really um, started a new era for parks and recreation. Prior to that, we were running recreation classes in the Carnegie Library and wherever we could in fact. Um, we're pretty excited to have 50 years of, of great spaces for recreation and arts and culture. Matt was, was reminding me that for the city of Boulder, Parks and Recreation is actually the largest provider of arts and, arts and cultural program. We do that in lots of ways, both formal and informal. Informally and indirectly, we're the place for lots of great things that happen. I believe you're going to take a walk outside in a little bit and see the Temple of Tranquility. That's just one example of art that happens in our public spaces. Uh, of course, Parks and Recreation is a, an enthusiastic supporter of the Percent for Art program, and I think we're going to be doing that even better in the years to come. The 24 budget that City Council just approved has some really exciting projects for the city, uh, including $20 million for the cafeteria, uh, the largest public space in downtown Boulder, $40 million for a major renovation and energy retrofit at the East Boulder Community Center, and a whole bunch of projects where I am excited to be, do better with public art in our facilities. North, that was um, had a major renovation in 2001. If you walk in there, there's still some really great examples of public art, the tornado, the, the windscreens that move around the top. All of those were um, a better iteration of art than we've done in this facility before. So that's all coming. Um, we partner with Studio Arts Boulder. The Pottery Lab is an early parks and recreation facility. When it um, was retired at a fire station and the city took ownership, it's been a, a pottery lab for, I think, over 40 years. And Studio Arts Boulder has operated it now for almost over, for over a decade. And they, they do a great job. Have a lot. Um, we have been the home to uh, performances at the Fringe Festival. Some of my favorite events ever. Did any of you go to the dirt performance in the racquetball court or the aquatic performance in the leisure pool? It was amazing. Um, so uh, 
We've done a lot in the past and looking forward to what's come. Bruce and I were just talking about the civic area. That's really going to be a great opportunity. One of the guiding principles from the 2015 um, master plan for the civic area is that it is an arts and cultural hub. And so I'm eager for the engagement. Uh, Chris Spear is on the executive team for that project. I know the arts commission will be consulted throughout um, 24 and 25 as we move into planning and then design for the next phase of civic area construction. That's Thank you for having us. Yeah, and you, you're in a build, this building so special to me. 18 years ago, um, I was a manager of the South Boulder Rec Center. It's, it is 50 years old. We are saying how loud is it at the end of its useful life. We're doing everything we can to milk um, some activity out of it while we can, while we plan for the future. Do you see the, the money that you'll be getting from council in a couple of years? Um, is it possible? I just heard from so many people that the dance groups that were using, what do we call it, the Civic, what do we call uh, it? The Civic Plaza. Civic Plaza next to the tea house. Uh -huh. You know, that was like the definition of community yeah. with different kind of dance groups yeah. holding public dances. Yeah. Like every night of the week yeah. or something different. It was the coolest thing. I loved it. And now it's just been taken over by, yeah. by zombies. Um, so in terms of activating the space and perhaps a better community oriented way, um, is there any way to get a process in place that's not too egregious for the various groups that want to hold things there? I, I share that question. We know that positive activity is the very best deterrent to negative activity. So I, let me just share a little bit about what I see as the planning horizons for this period. So short term, 24 and 25, we're going to be in that very, very thoughtful community engagement design process. And so there's not going to be physical changes. So what are short-term things we could do to change the, the vibe down there so that it feels a little better? I don't know the answer to that question. Chris and I have some conversations. We want the farmer's market to stay down there. That's another great activity that happens and really is positive activity. The dancing, I know there were some conversations and concerns about a dance floor and whatever, but I think that's a question. Um, that maybe we can follow up offline on the scene and maybe report back towards the next meeting or a couple of meetings. What is it looking for? Her? But so I'm going to call that the short term, right? The park as is 24, 25. What do we do to help it feel um, more vibrant, more active, more safe? And, and I think, and I think part of it was the insurance requirements that I don't know happened. the details, okay. but the good news is there's someone on our team who does, who was a part of those conversations in 2018 and 19, who happens to work with the next students. So, I mean, I don't know what is a deal we'll do for that short term horizon, but we can ask the question. That'd be great. So, the medium term horizon is um, 26, 27. The park's going to be under construction, the park east of Broadway. And so, we're going to have to see what does it look like? What all is closed? If you remember when we did phase one of the civic area west of Broadway, there were significant closures, areas were fenced off. We're going to need to look at that and figure out where, what do we do with the farmer's market? What all is under construction? And, and so, that's the middle term. The long term and the goal of the project is that we have this beautiful public space that is designed for great public activity that easily facilitates community gatherings that has safe and accessible restrooms. Um, so that's that's the long term. And so that's, you know, the process is underway. The question is, what do we do in that short term? And I, I don't have the answer, but we're, we're talking about it. Did you add anything? Yeah, just say look forward to the engagement part of this process because yeah. Great. Thanks, Chris. Thanks, Alan. Yeah. So, I mean, not an answer, but for sure hearing the question that we can report back. If not, I don't know if December is feasible, maybe January or February. What are we going to do for the 24, you know, really the peak warm season? Okay. Sounds good. I think Matt would um, confirm that I've been bringing this up every single year <laughs> since I've been on the Arts Commission. It's <laughs> <laughs> Uh, taking off my commissioner hat and being on my role as a volunteer for the Temple of Tranquility, I want to thank the Parks and Recreation Department. They've been so helpful in the whole process, uh, helping us find the beautiful plant that we're going to go visit, visit um, actually helping us with plans to mediate any damage on the lawn. Um, and very important to us, they were a team that got very involved in making the pillars that you'll see. There was a, a team that even had a current for our recreation. So thank you for your 
involved in any future. Um, I didn't do any of that. We have really great people that work for us, and I didn't ask all your appreciation. We, I, I hope you all know. I'm sure you see it with this folks. There are so many incredible people who work for this people that are here deeply about public service. I'm glad you're here. Great. Thanks for being here. Awesome. That's it. Thank you all. Enjoy the space. We're glad you're here. Thank you again for your service to our community. Thanks. So and have a great day. It was great to see you, and I yeah. think I will see you very soon. Have a Friday. Thank you. Ready to move on to grants? <laughs> Do you have anything you say? I will keep it very brief because it's a paper time. I cannot believe it has already been a year since many of us were together at Spark having a retreat conversation. Um, and I just wanted to reflect on what a retreat is about um, before you all dive into your work today in thinking about where this community is at. Um, and what's going to happen next week? We don't know, we're at a crossroads. We can all have some assumptions about um, how things are gonna go, um, but we're really at this space of reflection where we have a sunsetting community and cultural plan, um, but a great opportunity to reimagine where we're going when it comes to uh, what this community wants to be in the realm of arts and culture. So I'm so proud and glad for the partnership we have with this commission and the part role that you all play in mapping out what's coming next because it could be very transformational. And we have a goal of community vitality and for the organization and for this community to be the most culturally vibrant community on the front range. And there are lots of bits and pieces that already in many ways have us there in some ways, uh, but we have a lot of work to do in other ways. So um, really looking forward to seeing what comes next. So thankful for the hard work of Matt, Lauren, Brendan, Lisa, the Community Vitality team, and all the folks at the city that really helped to bring a lot of uh, cool, fun stuff to life. Because not all the work of the city is cool, fun, and interesting. I had a meeting yesterday about uh, backflow prevention devices in, uh, <laughs> in, in, in high-density residential buildings. So maybe we can incorporate art. Anyhow. <laughs> <laughs> Just really thank you all for taking the time today and uh, looking forward to seeing you both success. Thank you, Chris. Can we all need to do a little bit more things? Yes. Nice. Let me know. 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 Let all right, guys. So while Lauren is coming and embracing the original, um, I just want to sort of preface this real quick. Um, that as you know very, very well, this is the end of a, a three month process to really examine the grants program for next year. It's a practice that we put in place um, early on. Um, one of the um, criticisms of the grants program in 2015 and before was that it was sort of this Frankenstein's monster of just things that happened to the criteria, to the process, to the story. And this is a very deliberate and careful process that we put for you every single year to say, what can we improve and how can we do it in the interest of well, our goals? Um, and so I'm saying this just to thank you for bearing with us as we go through these changes. Um, and at this last moment, we hope what you'll see is that the conversation over the last three months has been translated into some real actionable things and that it's gonna serve the community really well next year. Um, and that uh, it will be an easy thing for you to approve. If it's not, that's okay. We can continue conversations and continue to improve, but we think we got it in a good place. So I think we got it. Okay. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you again for all of your work and for taking a little bit of time out of your retreat time to do some business. Um, it is very appreciated by our community members whose reports you reviewed because it means that they'll be paid instead of having to wait until November, December. So it is very appreciated. Um, first, the three grant reports that you received um, by our grant software. These are, I'll show you, and then I have um, language if you would like it. So 
You can approve all reports, approve individual reports, individual while submitting specific questions, postpone approval pending any answers to specific questions and or not approve individual reports and cancel the final 20%. So I have language, I'll put these up if you wanna discuss them individually or if you have questions about them individually. Oh, thank you. If you put up the motion language, that would be great. Sure. And then is there anybody who would like to pull out uh, a grant report from that before we make a motion? See, no. Would anybody like to make a motion? <clears throat> I move that we approve the grant reports from Mary Wilhelm, Anna Maria Fernando, and Wing Wong. Listen. All in favor? <clears throat> great. <clears throat> Unanimous. And uh, I'll open it for anybody who has comments on the reports. You know, <laughs> one of the things I was going to say later in the meeting is I, I wish, as, as the Arts Commission, we could, we could be this one word that I've been really enjoying lately that I think has been missing a little bit, innovative. And when I, when I read these grant reports, I'm reminded that's where the innovation typically comes in because each of those three things, this is so cool. Um, Mary's thing with the four by five, you know, it's just so cool. So I, I'm appreciative of the fact that our grant applicants are coming to us with really innovative projects. So thank you. <laughs> I would share that. I was really struck by the building. Um, how simple that idea was, <laughs> and I thought, oh, like was the community, and that was really an impactful. The timeline like, video was so much fun to watch. Yeah, <laughs> it was so fun. Yeah, and Mary's, um, Mary's, uh, Mary and Pat from her project did a dance the opening for the temple. Had people in tears. What you could do with that small stage was just incredible. And, Amazing, uh, uh, the fact that they were able to create something oh, that was great. Too. I want to make sure you support such a huge value. Thank you. <laughs> so, that was, I agree that it's really innovative and so cool to watch. Uh, purposely like read a report but just really being able to support our uh, I like that they brought various communities together uh, very collaborative uh, with the Lee Wong uh, on I think there's a there's a learnable moment for the potential for a town now type of collaboration uh, and and I I'd like to see more of an integration of a marketing plan, collaboration plan, and ideas for self-promoting to build audiences so that these things that are funded are bringing in more people for the most amount of people that they have. It's like you're reading my mind, Emory, <laughs> because I had that question for Lauren as to uh, the response <clears throat> in the report about um, a lack, a feeling of lack of support motion both with arts and culture and the board of arts alliance. Mm -hmm. And so my question to Lauren is if you could give us some feedback on whether that um, was uh, a, a learning opportunity and a growth opportunity for us, mm -hmm. or perhaps a uh, communication resources artists or mm -hmm. other plans. Oh sure. Yeah. yeah, it is always upsetting to be like that we go like oh yeah. Um, in the grant report. And how much of, the, of that is on the artist as well. Yeah. Yeah, so I do want to say uh, two thoughts came to mind when I saw that. The first is that, well, she's a first time applicant, which is wonderful. And so we know that she's going to like crush it. Hopefully she'll come back in the future for future applications. Um, we have 156 grants awarded this year, which actually speaks a lot to the work that you do. Thank you very much. Um, thank you so much for all of your time and effort and energy that goes into all of that and to building the grant program and making it work so smoothly. Um, but on the same side, it means that we have 156 programs, grantees that we're trying to support over time, right? 
Um, we do have a note in our like in the follow up email that they get that says, "Hey, congratulations! Here's how you do your report. Be sure to email us and tag us and let you know. Let us know. Send us photos so we can promote your work." And there's a lot going on. I think if you're an applicant or like this is your first kind of big project, so I'm sure that that gets buried. Um, but it is there to say like you kind of have to reach out to us because that is a lot like a charming list, right? But the other thing that I think is really exciting, we have a new press person with the um, Human Vitality Office who is amazing, really energetic, super smart. And I've already spoken to her. I already like absorbed her. <laughs> Chris, you're mouse. I've already grabbed her and <laughs> said like, well, you're gonna help us. And she had this, um, some granting organizations do like grantee highlights, little interviews and like little blog pieces. We talked about something like that. Other ways that we can show off what we're doing other than just our Instagram, social newsletter, that kind of thing. So I think she's going to be really instrumental in helping us like build out because we have so much amazing things happening, so much great content. Part of it is just like finding other venues and outlets for free. So that all depends. Yeah, yeah. just a hearing clarification. Did you say that the the outreach to the artists happened when they're complete and providing the report back? No, no. Okay. So it happens, sorry. Um, when I send back their completed documents, it's oh, like, see. hey, here's your documents, money's coming. Also, here's how you do your report. Be sure to use our logo and please like let us know so we can promote your event. So those are the like, but that's, I mean, it's a lot. Like it's a lot of paperwork, a lot of process, right? If you're a first time grantee. So I can see how it'll flow like but is there anything that is possible to automate just drop that into a separate email or something like that or um we i don't do want to make out later. 156 other emails those are actual me emailing people too yeah, <laughs> yeah. i'll think about it i we do have some automated processes that we like in our software but i need to look at it but just a thought yeah totally anything to get them if they send us content we can use it right yeah. like all of you uh, m many of you have sent me something right like yeah stuff happening at the temple or whatever performances like that's what we need though is that kind of prompting for 156 plus all of our how many organizations do we have involved in 150 190. yeah 190 nonprofits not mentioning artists and yeah so so yes but no sorry sorry wing <laughs> um okay Jeffrey did you have another okay. I just uh, nothing else. thank you I did have a comment yes just not only for the Beaver Dog, but just a small organization holder in general. This year I've had the opportunity to see several um, plays mm -hmm. that I was, I'm still affected by. That they left. Um, and so I just want to. Highlight like our small organization in town that are doing work. They're providing safe spaces to have on country. Um, I just went to see Old Country by uh, Betsy's doing that, and that was hard, but it was it's something that needs to be said. You know? um, and I saw I could enjoy myself by <laughs> local theater. That which I'm not sure. Um, and there were gender issues that were in that, which is like were so impactful. So just small arts organization. I'll be sure that they hear your comments and the comments on the reports. Thank you. There was a really nice report on Betsy opening on and you know, this one as well. Oh, good. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Okay, back to business. We're almost done, I hope, maybe. So um, we have our cultural grant cycle blueprint step four. So this is the last piece in our uh, review of the grant program and updates to the grant program. As Matt mentioned, we did make some final edits from your comments at the last meeting. Thank you all so much for your final input and then so I have a little summary of the final edits that were made, which you would have received in your packet. And then I have language that's the vote language because part of what we need to do today is to approve the grant program, but we need to approve the administrative 
the administrative approval. So some of the grants are first come first serve, they're lottery style, right? So it's the commission giving permission for staff to approve those as long as they're eligible first come first serve for lottery style, then they're approved through our system, right? They're not like you're making judgments on them or and staff certainly aren't making judgments on them. So it's you giving us power to just go forward with all of those awards. Um, these final review updates were updates to the leadership pipeline process. So you might've seen that we now have a written response instead of a in-person interview, right? And then you'll discuss at the meeting. So timeline changed, a few things changed in that application process, but really to remove the interview, live interview process. Uh, Boulder focus score has returned at six points now to the community project grants, arts education grants, and hypothetically for the future for general operating support grants, but those are not for next year. Minor edits to community project arts education grants, including recommendations on budgeting for overhead. So this is something we talked about. We did some research on best practices and for funding organizations go anywhere from like 10% to 35% of project grants that should be spent on overhead. So we put in some links, put in some language there to say, please be sure to pay your artists sufficiently, right? The Arts Commission recommends that. Um, this is how much is best practice to use for overhead from a project. Um, okay. <laughs> it was in the packet. And then finally, this is not in the official grant program, but something that was mentioned was um, working with organizations that have leadership that are hiring lots of volunteers, lots of staff. So we have engaged the equity project to work overtime this year and next with organizations that were specifically invited that hire a lot of people or use a lot of volunteers in this new folder. So as a private invite to larger organizations, we didn't include some for-profit organizations. Um, and they'll be talking specifically about workplace culture, HR practices, hiring, retention, very specific workshop for those, like a series of workshops for those organizations. Um, and also potentially some consulting. If somebody says, you know what, I think I really like this, but I think we need to do more personal private consulting, we might be able to pay for like one session and then they could continue on. Something like that to get them like so they're they have somebody that they know is a good like working with them well like that they have a good contact with that they know the content and then they can build up something more private if they're really looking for something specific if you are all right with that I have my sir okay, yes i wanted to just take a moment if it's okay and linger on something else um that there, there's also some uh, tweaks we've been doing, um, not so much in the criteria or process, but um, in the communications with our applicants once they get a grant that are specifically responsive to the conversation we've been having about um, the report that the Boulder Ballet provided, the trouble we had with that. Mm -hmm. And so I also wanted to point out that, um, Correct me if I'm oh, not framing this right. <laughs> when we reach out to an organization to say, or to an applicant to say, you have received a grant, we send them instructions, including how to help with marketing and what to do with reporting. But we're also going to start to say um, that they should um, be careful about their uh, expense tracking and record keeping because we reserve the right to audit the budget once they submit it. And the second thing is um, a recommendation. Oh, boy. Um, how do I frame this? You have better words for this than I do. Um, a recommendation that if they have any leftover funds oh, okay. in the grant, that they come to us to talk about it, and that the commission recommends that those funds either be used on that project or be returned. Um, and, and I want to be clear about that it's not a requirement because we feel that that would not serve our purposes. It's a, a strong recommendation that that's the best practice. So I want you to bear that in mind. And if it's okay, while we're on the subject, George and I have been speaking here because um, George had some good information to share at the last meeting um, and actually the last, the previous two meetings. And because of the rules of, uh, of process and transparency, there wasn't a real way in Robert's Rules of Orders to allow Georgia to say what was to be said. And so we've talked about it, we talked with our attorneys and 
what we've come to is that it's it's not great for us to not hear this, right? Um, and that um, the way that we could um, open this up is that we need to be clear we're not questioning the decision. The decision was made, it was a majority vote, it was all done properly. Um, and we're not going back in time to revisit issues, but what we are doing is improving our ability to do this work. And that's the tone, right? And that's something Georgia has brought up time and again, actually, for years, is that one of the things that's uh, important for us to do is to be uh, provided with the tools to be the best commissioners that you possibly be, right? And so in that interest, um, we want to open that floor back up and talk for a moment about George's observations of that process. And um, so maybe that can inform what we do in the future. Did I, I cover that okay? Yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah, just a question of process for you in Georgia, because um, I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say. Do you feel like that is something that we should be listening to as we consider the changes to this document, or is this something that, that we should vote on the changes and then hear what you have to say, or do you think it informs? In my opinion, I think you could have that conversation now. Okay. I, I hope what you find is that we're pointing in the right direction and maybe this will, hearing this will inform not only your confidence in moving this forward, but also okay. later on in the meeting, we talk about what you want to do this year. Yeah. So that's what I would keep yeah. in mind. It's like, does this give us to do? So, great. Yeah. so one thing that I want to share, I've been on Arts Commission before when I was in um, one thing I'll say is that the Arts Commission did not do grants. They had a separate team of people that did grants. Um, and as a person who and lived in Encinitas, I also volunteered at the Support Force and Support Garden, and I applied for a lot of grants. The grants were very specific. You know, they were, this is money for you know, uh, it was very specific. I think there's a reason for that because you know, money goes towards specific things. Um, so I think that I don't know, I think it's important people receive money. Money spent. If that money was for a program, then it goes to the program. And it's very big. We have watched So, um, I just would. And there was something that I read that was about, you know, recommending that we spend 10 to 35% mm -hmm. uh, that mm -hmm. wouldn't. Yes, yeah. Um, and so when I did the math, that was $3,500 that might go to something else other than the program, but there was $5,000. That went to, you know, um, so that, you know, there was another commissioner on the floor who said, you know, it's really important for us to look at these numbers. The taxpayers are relying on us to, you know, be the keepers of this money. And, uh, I, uh, when I look at that report, and then I look at, they're, they're a large organization, and then I look at the report that was also in that same evening from the Catamounts, which was a $3,000, and the number of people, children, that was reached uh, with a small organization. So Boulder Ballet, you know, they wrote this. First time it was 10, and the second time it was 14, and the third time it was 15. As a teacher, it was four people that were 
were shown in that. So that's ten thousand dollars that went to four people in Catamount. Uh, Three thousand dollars reached the entire school. They didn't get to complete the program, so they gave back nine hundred dollars. You know, um, I have a few questions. Maybe they're also for our sure. Um, so I think you brought up really valuable science grants. I guess my question is, what, what is our obligation to kind of thoroughly review and scrub the accounting for all these projects? And where do we put the bonus back on the folks that won the grants to support that they're using the money for their projects rather than I mean, that's, you know, we're not, we're not accounts. Yeah. <laughs> so, so when do we, you know, in a way, when you win that grant, you should be obligation by the person who win that grant for using the money appropriately. We're not always the gatekeepers. That's a good question. And I also sure. would say, like, it's a tricky situation because if I had read the grant from the beginning, um, as because I'm a dance teacher, I could have told you, like, it doesn't cost $10,000 to run the class. Uh, otherwise, we'd have more dance teachers. So, so moving forward, and, and if there were a theater project that came across my group, since I'm a dance teacher, if a theater thing came across, and then I wouldn't have. Uh, knowledge to say, oh, it doesn't cost this much or it costs more than this time. I wonder if there's like something that we could have that, I don't know, would say like running one dance class costs about this much, a theater production costs about this much that would inform us something simple so that when these numbers come across our work just so that we're more informed but we're not not bookkeepers like some best practices guidelines line item in Texas mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah because we can't say you know standard theater is going to cost this not either the standard is something or other will cost this because it's just that there's not a standard cost for a production uh, sometimes the venue may be donated, sometimes the venue may be rented. Uh, but I like the idea of uh, you know putting uh, putting emphasis on line item costs or if you're looking for ten thousand dollars of support towards something, what is the project going to cost and what is the line item for each of the, what what are the line items for each of the expenses you're anticipating? Is it a perfect math now? And that should get that. I may answer questions. If I may speak words that hopefully, <laughs> <laughs> because I, I don't have an answer at this point, uh, because um, the, the practice of how to read a budget has been largely just left to the commissioners over the years. Um, and that means that the personality of each commission changes. Sometimes we have people with experience and can immediately read it and sometimes it's a struggle, right? So um, that is a vulnerability in our program. Um, the other part of it is that um, like most grants programs, we rely on the organizations to be truthful and to check their information before they submit because it is on them if they are making mistakes or are not seeing the truth, right? So. Um, the, there, there's a little bit of the underlying assumption of good intent that we rely on. And this is frankly the first time it's ever come up that that may not have been enough, right? Those, those two things together were not enough to, to catch this, right? And so um, we took some little steps that I described for next year. Um, but another thing to think about, and this will be work for the term of next year, is that we do need to examine 
the grants program in more detail and talk about the resources. And so Lauren and I have already had some brief discussions about maybe proposing some different formats for how we read grants generally, but also very specifically to the budget of maybe having a professional grant reader who looks through all the budgets, who can make comparisons, audit if we need to, um, and provide you with the report. So not necessarily you read the budget and here's a list of comparables so much as here's a professional who's read the budget, checked up on things that did look good. We communicated with the applicant to, you know, and talked about changes that they might need. You know, we can build in a step. Now, what we don't have to get that done is money, right? To pay someone to do that work. So what we need to do is um, over the course of next year, as we talk about all the programs and what we need to do for the future and possibly with very different circumstances, depending on the outcome of the election, um, we need to start out a conversation and we need to advise staff on creating a strategy to get us to the point where hopefully by the 2025 cycle, we are creating a new grant system, possibly very new, that does some of those things and takes the burden off of you so that you can focus on what you need to, mm -hmm. which is what's the best use of the taxpayer dollars on project and organization and checking it that that gets done rather than so it's a conversation. Can I just throw in a little, little tidbit because I'm, I'm not convinced you were done, but I just wanted to. Oh, okay, okay well, um, what a, a low tech way to help the situation would be, and I've had this happen on numerous boards that I've served on, is when recruiting for new members, perhaps one of the qualities they're looking for every so often would be somebody with finance experience mm -hmm. that knows spreadsheets backwards and forwards. You know, Jeffrey works at a bank. I don't know if he's a money guy. He's <laughs> like, I think he's more of a people person. I, I put just as much emphasis on impact and infrastructure of a company based on their uh, their operating budget as the, the much as I do. Yeah, I'm just saying, I don't, I, yeah. I don't assume that you know you're a spreadsheet master just because you work at a bank. Right. But maybe when we're recruiting, that could be one of the things we look for every five years to be sure somebody on the commission is um, you know great at spreadsheets and can look at stuff and and help inform us fellow commissioners like you know this is something we need to watch out for whatever and the priorities in your and the proclivities of your of your commissions are going to change mm -hmm. as the people on those change so having a grant reader might not provide as much guidance as a changing dynamic of a board does mm -hmm. and it doesn't I mean, there will be different, there will be different priorities yeah. for different groups. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I, I hear where that might be a good idea, but it also skews what the recommendations are. Well, and I think that's a really good point. So I think um, it, but the board members change because we want our sound to change to get back updated with the community. Yeah. And we need to balance that with some things. Yeah. And a board reader is, yeah, a, a, a grant reader is going to look at very different things, each of us individually. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Even we set standards. I will say that Commission and his units, they had a like I was the dance representative, and then they had a music representative, they had a science representative. So each person that was on the board was a professional in their whatever genre you feel. Yeah. So that um like I said, we didn't see grants, but we had other things that we had to do. But, um, you know, for example, if we had something that says, and you can't say specifically how much it costs to do a production, but you can do a ballpark, you know, what if, when you're working with five actors, when you're working with 10, you know, about how much it costs, because like as an instructor, I can tell you, you know, to do 20 classes for studio rental is $500. And then if I pay myself $40 a class for 20 classes, that's $800. So 800 is 500 is $1,300. So it's cost about $1,300 to do a class. For that particular organization at that particular bank. 
Right. Correct. So to have a grant that's ten thousand dollars for the class, if you have this sheet that says approximates, you can go, oh hey, wait, that's that's way different. Let me have a look at this. Or you ask know. questions in the yeah. comment section, like why is that number so high? Um, I also heard in what you were saying, Georgia, some pushback on the idea of what is incorporated into this document about the recommendation of 10 to 35 percent for general operating expenses or mm -hmm. keeping the lights okay. on. Yeah. So uh, perhaps staff can speak to that a little bit. Um, I did a deep dive into like best practices from all of our as many colleagues as I could find, and. Um, just for, for nonprofits in general, so not just arts nonprofits, there is a really broad range, as I mentioned, and some, um, there's also uh, some like scores for nonprofits and the way that they score the nonprofit is based on the percentages. Like whenever they're looking at a grant, they're like, oh, only 10% is given to, to um, overhead or 35% because some, some granting organizations are thinking it's important that an organization can keep lights on in order to do these programs, right? So they put more emphasis on the higher end of the scale. And then there's others that are looking at bigger nonprofits that are looking at lower overhead costs because you're just doing more with your, like you have a bigger. So it sort of depends on, I think, I, I think this is a really, really good guide for people. This isn't like a, you have to do this. But I think it's a really good way for us to leave them behind in the grant program to show organizations like, yes, we want you to pay the person writing this grant. We want you to pay your directors and for your lights. But this is kind of a best practice to look at this range of costs while you're building out your budget. Because we have said that randomly in the Boulder Arts Week grants, like we have said that aside, but this is super direct. It's like, here's overhead costs. Here's like links to livable wages for artists in this area very specifically right here. There's one more thing to add in there. I'm sorry, I can't remember it. But it's other guidelines are kind of recommendations, right? And it doesn't say, it says the Boulder Arts Commission recommends. It doesn't say you have to do this or you will be penalized, but it gives also the commission and the panelists reading these with the commission some kind of like frame like you're talking about, right? So if somebody's saying, I'm gonna spend 50 or 75% of my grant on overhead, you can say like, that's not necessarily like a best practice in the nonprofit world, right? So I do think we start with this next year. I'm really curious to see what I'm gonna hear back about it, what we're gonna hear back about it. And um, if it changes anything, you know, I haven't like, I also haven't dug into the budgets enough reviewing them to see what our, like a general percentage of the overhead is frankly, but we're gonna find out now, we're gonna see. So how to do that. Do you feel comfortable with that? So it's in the grants that you would be reading to the arts education community park. Is it, uh, um, in your opinion, is it something that you would like to see more organizations putting in the budget that they are proposing as part of their application? Oh yeah, yeah. I would hope that they're including it because I, I do think it's just, I mean, all of you have like worked a nonprofit volunteer and you've seen a nonprofit, but you've seen them all. And to think that somebody's there writing a grant that they're not getting paid for that, or you're not hiring, you're not paying your overhead staff, you're not paying your the rental space for the rooms, like those kind of things, that's just impossible. That is not how the world functions, right? So we have to be like understanding, and then that that limit of where we're understanding, at least now, is like a little framed, right? It's a little bit, there's some guidance for applicants. They have we have grants for administrative, we have grants for general operating. So I just mm -hmm. feel like when someone's writing for Project that money should go to the project, not to general operating. It's certainly worth saying that in the comment section. There is a comment section for in the financial section to say you know that you get a general operating support grant. Well, and also too, there's nuance there which I know you know about mm -hmm. is there's overhead to run the program, right? Yeah. It's like if 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 it were me and I saw a grant where one said uh, part of this funding is going to pay. Um, our uh, IT tech to keep our computers running, that would be a red flag. However, if they said, we need a technician to do a digital projection in order to do our performance, you know, that's that's the type of overhead that uh, Lauren's talking about, this, what, 35%? Yeah, 
the um, security staff and the maintenance yeah, staff like open the doors. Like order to get your room. Room. That's, yeah, that's yeah. part of the project. Yeah, but right. in this other situation, yeah, that money did not go towards the project. Admittedly, and so that's that's the nuance is we're describing in the project grants. It's recommended that your budget that you're submitting with your application is um, for this project, and ten to thirty percent of that can be the overhead needed to get the project done. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I believe paying a director in order to create and mount the program and pull together the resources is appropriate. There may be other things that are not. And that's part of the reading is you need to hear from them and ask the questions necessary in the reading to say, is this really to get this project done? And you may, that has to make sense in your mind, right? It's part of that the unfortunate squishy subjective part is you need to interpret their description of why they need to pay their director part of this funding in order to get that done. And sometimes I think that's going to be very legitimate. And sometimes now we know that's going to be less clear and needs immediate clarification. And so trying to get in front of that mode of clarification. Yeah. I'm also just wondering, and, and I appreciate the breadth versus depth, but, and I, I don't think it's about strict formula, but some kind of relating it to impact. Like how, how much are you, you know, because you talked about mm -hmm. four kids versus three, not the four classrooms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and so, mm -hmm. If you're hitting more people, then you might need more staff. Yeah. Mm -hmm. To coordinate, yeah. yeah. It's really, that's what it's about. That's mm -hmm. I mean, you, you could, we, we could conceivably have a question on it, like just straight off the bat. Uh, in your best judgment, how many people would be uh, affected isn't the right word, but uh, uh, um, impacted by this project is there a, like a thing where they put in a number it's uh, in the data the you know what what are you i always ask you know like, what is the quality and quantity and impact going to be and what are you trying yeah but i'm just wondering all those big words they all sound good and people put in stuff and blah 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 okay. it might be interesting as an experiment of nothing else to say like in in a in number form, what do you expect the impact to be? Best case scenario, worst case. I don't know. It would be an interesting data point. And this reminds me of I went to you you enjoy myself. Mm -hmm. I'm still thinking about it. That was <laughs> like over a month ago. And I um I went with a friend who would not she doesn't go to theater, but I was like, come on. And I met with her last week for happy hour. And she was like, I'm still thinking about that play. I was telling my friends about it. You know? So I just, you know, impact. Impact can be deep as well as broad. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that came up in previous, actually, two previous yes. grand applications. Yes. But Questions about small numbers, but what they asked them to demonstrate that those people would be affected by how really sounds so many questions. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it's uh, there's no exact science or formula to a lot of the stuff we're doing. So sometimes it's just <laughs> nice to see at worst case, they'll have 10 people show up, best case, they get 100 people to show up. That's one data point you can compare now to another grant that's applying and you see that minimum is going to be 1200 maximum is 8000 that that tells you a lot right there it could also be contact hours so that if it's a continuing class so they're going 10 mm -hmm. people but they're going for five weeks right that can be the same as 50 people going once right yeah. When I think this stuff is all very subjective, like there's how many people are in the class versus what have the teachers learned about it, and then how many people are in the audience, and how how good, how effective was the art, and how many people are now talking about it. Like there are so many different ways to measure that. I don't want to get so myopic that we lose opportunities for artists to create, especially for emerging programs. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm.
Well, this isn't an answer to any of this, but I am going to the Grant Makers and Arts Conference from Sunday to Wednesday in Puerto Rico. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was thinking, wow, there's so many of these questions that I cannot wait to ask my colleagues how they address these or see how they address them. Small funding organizations, large funding. I mean, the Ford Foundation, last time I saw a presentation about their $6 billion fund or something, right? Like, I'm really, and Brendan's coming up, but you're implicated in this too. Yeah. So I think there is some learning that we should do in that in a few of these areas too that I think are going to be really useful for us. So wait, do we need to go to Puerto Rico as well? Yeah, I think so. I look forward to reviewing your applications for the grant. You know there we go. Yeah, so many impact. Thank you. Okay, well, you go first. Well, my question is actually to you. Just um, real, real quick. What if they didn't judge grants? What did the Encinitas Arts Commission do? Um. So, well, we met once a month for a towel. <laughs> <laughs> Let me just. <laughs> and we have a list of things that we had to do. Um, to bring arts in the community and Sanitas. And the one thing that I remember the most, we had to like um, do, present art in, like we had to present a music uh, event. We had to present a music event that would, people would interact. Um, we had to do, you know, a dance event that would inter engage the community and then had to do a dance event with that they would just observe. Like there was a list of things. That they so the Arts Commission was organizing these events? Mm -hmm. They were programming? Um, Thank you, that's the word of yeah. <laughs> were you Were you working with artists to pick what was going to be performed? Okay. Yeah. That's, well, and, I don't want to get into that job. <laughs> yeah. Well, and there's one thing that I remember. <laughs> yeah. And we said, well, then we had like an art festival <laughs> performances and engaged. So it was the first annual Estes Arts um, um, arts event. And so I was in charge of the dance stage. So I had to. I went to all of the dance schools in Encinitas and invited them to perform. Mm -hmm. I said yes. Okay. Coordinate the schedule and the dancers and music. And just... So technically, it was one hour a month. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. It was. It was. So that's what we did. Okay. Thank you. And I worked in yeah. on Colorado Creative Institute. Yeah. Um, we did not. accessible, you can apply for a grant too. It's not, it's not rocket science. So I want to bring our attention to the time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Oh, very important conversation. I think it folds into what we had scheduled a little bit later. So I think we'll make up some time there. And um, and I think it's definitely part of the ongoing conversation of what we bring into 2024 and how we, the prism through which we are doing new applications. Now that this is on top of mind that we're looking at budget items and have the capacity to ask for an audit and ask more questions. So I'd like to suggest that we move on, <laughs> please. And um, if that's okay, we can feel like we completed the yes. statement that you've set out. Right. There's one other thing I'm just going to throw completely very fast. And you can either just talk here or talk about it later. Um, we're looking at, so I'm looking, what I'm thinking about is small organizations, large organizations. And as I said before, I'm going to be seeing small organizations. Um, 
And when I look at, you know, large organizations giving grants in the numbers of like ten thousand and twenty thousand dollars a year, three years, small organizations getting a few thousand dollars. Uh, I'm wondering if I am wondering if we can bridge the gap a little, especially if we're going to be having getting more money so that smaller organizations are going to be larger. Okay. Because this is a conversation that we can very easily pull into the approval of the budget as we start to look at how the or how the grant money is getting split between large and small organizations. For general operating support grants? Yes. Oh, that would be for 2025. Okay. So you're not deciding yeah. on grants. On the general operating support grants, those aren't up for. Those are done through 25. Yeah. Right. So, yes. but that's part yeah. of that conversation. Of oh, when yeah. Money is going yeah. to fall. Yeah. And we may mm -hmm. have a different pot of money to work that. Yeah. Way. So I, I don't, yeah. I'm yeah. suggesting yeah. that that yeah. is yeah. the time that we can have a discussion. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I mean, for me personally, it's, it's important to keep in mind that what's that? Amount that's going to large organizations in percentage compared to their operating budget, and how many people do they employ, and and what is the infrastructure of that entire organization within the city of Boulder? How many how many Boulderites is that actually paying for the next two? Thank you, thank you all so much. I um I do want to say that the community really deeply appreciates that you spend so much time and thought on energy on this because. They see it coming out in the grant program and they see it when you're talking about these things that really matter to all of them. Like, I cannot tell you how many times the community tells me that they are really appreciative of your time and energy and thought that goes into all of this. So, thank you. Um, so, next, we just have the motion language to approve the budget itself or to approve the, the program. And then the motion language, as I mentioned, to approve the, um, the delegation of some of the uh, grants to staff. And that's not that's making decisions that's really it's the first come first serve you are eligible so but this is the overall approval we do this at our retreat it's kind of a like step into the new year <sighs> it feels okay can we go back one slide sure and i'm wondering so, if you could put a pin in the mm -hmm. like we as a commission could use some time with the equity project mm -hmm. to talk about how we review these grants, how far the language we use, or mm -hmm. just to continue to educate ourselves on how we should support the community. Sure. So yes. I was thinking the same thing. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. And I have no yeah. thought on that too. So great. Yes. Thank you. All right. So if we can get a motion, <laughs> then uh, if we have any additional uh, comments and discussion about the specific table language that was presented. I move to approve the 2024 cultural grant to program budget structure and endorse the staff approval process for the presentation. Discussion. I have uh, one typo for oh, no. uh, clarification. Mm -hmm. It's on page 20. Yeah. Um, it's on page 20 under the leadership. Type oh, yes. Okay. Scholarship. It's like page 20. <laughs> um, and it's just between the first and the second sentences. Mm -hmm. There's just something grammatically going on. Oh, okay. Uh, it reads as mentioned in this description, the program selection criteria will consider a number of factors, including but not limited to applicants identify as a member of racial or ethnic, ethnic minority group and commitment to pursuing a career in arts leadership, mm -hmm. period. And then new sentence, the potential of the applicant to catalyze positive change in the, so there, that needs to be linked up. Somewhere. Sure. Yes. Thank you. Got it. Another discussion and the proposed changes. Okay, all in favor. Thank you. <laughs> Shoot. So long Four months later. later. Yes, thank you. <laughs> and then this is the delegation that I mentioned. So these are for the artist hiring incentive, which is uh, lottery style, and then the rest are first come first serve. I will start that by saying I move that we delegate decisions for the following grant categories to staff, the Arts Hiring Incentive, Cultural Field Trip Fund, Grant Writing Assistance Fund, Professional Development Scholarships, 
and venue and online event affordability funds. Fantastic. Discussion? All in favor. Thank you. Um, just two more slides for me. One is the sponsorship committee. You saw a probably kind of lengthy explanation about the sponsorship committee and the packet. It is a group that um, we have some sponsorship funds as part of our budget for programs that specifically do not do well in the grant program are not permitted by the grant program, right? Um, some support for business of the arts um, funding. This year we're helping like the Newport Art District build an ABA ramp. We, the grants can't go towards capital construction. So there's some of those like smaller funds the very small funds generally, it's like up to $3,000 or something, but we do need, we have Bruce. Thank you so much, Bruce, as our sure. committee member this year, but we do prefer to have two just to get outside input if anybody wants to volunteer for the upcoming year. It is literally an email or two every couple months because there's not a lot of funds in it. It's a very rare kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Thank I love you. That. Yeah, it's great. It's good to know about too. Anyone else? Or anyone else? It's really yeah. easy. I send you an email. We review it in staff. I send you an email and we and, say, and I'm happy to step down because I'll be coming off, I guess, in April or so. Oh, that's but we right. Change that. Yeah. <laughs> this, is not, this is my. We talked about money. We didn't tell you what you're doing. Nice, try. Sure. <laughs> you can talk about <laughs> You can flip the point. Anybody else? It's very minimal. I, that I will probably. It's extremely that. minimal. And Lauren's like got all her ducks in a row before she ever even contacts you. Mm -hmm. She's got this very, very clear and clean, and it's easy to make a decision. This is my year of no. One more person. Wait, explain it again. These are small awards that go to requests that we get from the community for things that cannot be funded by the grant program. So uh, for example, we just did one for the Noble Art District to help build like an ADA ramp to get into their gallery because capital construction projects cannot be funded by the grant program. So these are like things that are done by the community that they're like, hey, we need $3,000 for this ramp. They come in very rarely. I think we have funds for two or three of them next year. I mean, it's like a rare little side thing, but we like to have Commission members involved just so you like see what's going on. You think of things that we are not thinking of, we're not approving it as staff people. Okay, I'll send an email that says, Staff approved this. What do you think about this? And if you have something, you know, crazy like something out of the box, but generally we review it. And if we, we have declined in the past, just ourselves before it even gets to the commission, it's not relevant. I can read a few more emails. Thank you. Thank you both so much. I promise it will be tight before it gets to you. And then just last steps for your calendars. Um, we have two grant 2020. Now that it's approved, it's gonna get out of our brand new city website. By the way, we updated our, we're going to the city's website page instead of having like a bespoke page. So you will see that very soon. Um, two grant info sessions. This one is great. I'm, I invited like eight of my colleagues from the funding world to come and talk about what funds they have available, they each get like five minutes and it's just like a, you know, Colorado Creative Industries, like statewide, countywide, citywide, anything that people in the city of Boulder can apply for. Um, it'd be really good. We have a big RSVP list already because it's annual now, it's great. And then this one, please, for commissioners, the grant training, we'll go through the grant program for the upcoming year. We'll talk about the application process. Get some, I was gonna say, I'll get some food, uh, some bribery food, I know. But, um, and I do need, you don't have to say this right now, but if anybody can, okay, this is your year. No, uh, I guess oh, I have you until next year. Why don't we go into it in? Okay, great. Oh, thank you. So we asked for commissioner to come and answer questions, but cool. Thank you. Perfect. Phew. Sorry, Carl. I think I went over your okay. time there. <laughs> So guys, uh, we're changing the agenda a little bit. We have our guest speaker um, here early. Thank you for your patience for that. that. Um, and with your permission, since uh, it's going to change the timing of our break, um, if you need to take care of yourself, feel free to do that um, session. Oh, hostage. <laughs> Let's wrap up. So um, I'm going to introduce Carl. You can come pick this up. Okay. Yeah. Right. So Carl Castillo uh, is uh, with the city manager's office, and his responsibilities. Oh boy. Yeah. I'm going to 
I'm going to capture this really well for you. Yeah, uh, sure is, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, Carl uh, manages our relationships with other governments, particularly the state and the federal government, uh, districts, and, uh, others, you know, sort of stakeholders in our lives. Um, is in charge of the citywide partnerships and pulling together different teams of people who partner with government organizations. And very critically, manages the city council process for identifying, identifying the legislative agenda, which is basically the city council's advocacy platform. Um, and that's a big deal. And the reason why you were asked to join yes. us, um, yeah, <laughs> because um, there is a, there's a whole process about how city council goes through that. It does mean that the city municipal government can go to the county and state federal government and fight for things that are good for our community. Um, and it is also, a, um, it's a really transparent process that you can get involved with. And I know that's been important because um, through, you know, through speaking city council, through your annual letter to them, there oftentimes comes up things at state and federal government. I, I just received an email last night that there was a bill on the floor of the House of Representatives to completely cut the funding of the NEA. And then three hours later, there's another email saying the RN was pulled out of the fire. So there was no chance for Carl Wayne at all on that. But the point is, is that there's so much going on that's so important in this community. And we do have a mechanism for the community to represent itself. And that's your job, right? Did I capture that? Yeah, yeah. yeah, especially that last component that's really yeah. good kind of the codification of our council's policy wishes. So, you know, we are impacted by governmental entities outside of the city. We want to make a positive impact that affect the interests of our community. And so what I work on is help coordinate the identification of what those policy interests are, codified into a policy statement, um, which council adopts at least once a year, they revise it this one additional times a year, and then to advocate for it. And there's obviously priorities. This is quite a great focus at identifying certain priorities that we focus on. Mostly work on the legislative front. So at the state capitol is, is definitely where the most work occurs. Um, that's that's where I have the greatest interface with um, council and, and staff members. So the bills being introduced, uh, and, and I know that there's a policy interest. I will bring it to the of that, for example, um, and I'll say, you know, does this impact our, our program? It doesn't, it may or may not be addressed here, but I still might bring it to that attention and say, does this hurt us? Does this help us? Is this something that we want to amend and engage in? Um, at the federal level, um, not, not as much, at least traditionally, we haven't as much. Uh, we can involve more with the other ones request, congressionally directed study of the place. As we call these things, it's basically what Congress is uh, even up the agencies to make grants to various uh, entities throughout, throughout the country. They say, we're going to grant this agency to give $500,000 to the city holder for this project. And it's going to be a request that was initiated by Senator Bennett. And he's championed it through the appropriations process. So that's earmarks. Um, uh, it is not a way to that condition. So, so we spend a lot of time doing that, but we also um, uh, do do policy advocacy at the federal level, especially when there's a unique interest. So, for example, advocating for keeping the federal laboratories well funded, um, keeping them in Boulder. It was about many years ago now. Some of them relocated to, to uh, Norman, Oklahoma. And so those are that's an example of like well we don't speak for the labs so we're not allowed to advocate who's going to so it's it's a reflection of the fact that at the federal level we're obviously going to have much less impact we do have federal lobbies there but because we're just you know, because it's so challenging to get things passed in Congress um, our greatest impact is going to be when we have something that's very unique to say you know uniquely in that place where so um, anyway, I did not create a presentation. I have because I, I was almost uh, first of all I was told about to. I understand this, this sort of discussion. Um, I can I can say more about how this process works and how it plays out. 
or we can just shift right to a conversation and and uh, kind of try to deal with your your questions and uh, participate in the discussion as as you see appropriate. What should we be thinking about that we're not as an arts commission? Where do we have, what trends are you seeing that we should be thinking about? I would I would hope and think given your delegation of state reps and senators on a regional scale, uh, got a a pathway that's decently sane. But what are your biggest challenges? Mm -hmm. Politically, politically, uh, uh, process wise, yeah. So you know, from a state legislative delegation, we've been very fortunate that we're response to delegation members, uh, and of course, delegation members that have been leadership to the state member for what's been the advice of the state. Obviously, the speaker of the House to go, governor, it's quite a problem in the summer city, so uh, doesn't, we're in okay shape there. Um, I guess it's some of the best lobbyists. Um, uh, so I'm not sure that really responds to your question, but that there was definitely a good relationship with uh, we haven't had had a good opportunity to shape this. Your question about like well, what should we be looking at? Uh, I know that in the past there were bills to create cultural districts, creative creative districts, for example. Um and I don't know that we got involved. I don't know if there's something more coming along those, those lines. Um, Is that similar to what Chris oversees with uh, uh, North Boulder Art District and some of the other so. districts that you oversee, including Transit Center and that type of stuff? Less so because there's no tax planner for the North Boulder okay. Arts District. Because that's the hill. But, so, yeah, yeah, right. There were be some. He does all of that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, about 10, 15 years ago when they created that designation, which is a line that in the United States. And I thought that it was, was part of what uh, I don't recall what tense benefits came with that. Uh, but it was about the case of the district. Didn't come up with it, but that is a, that's part of the battle, too. So, yeah, the yeah. same in Steamboat. You have to have a sign, Steamboat Creative. Right, right, right. Well, it's invited to the stadium. Right. You know, it's a table of I actually love it. Don't call it. Welcome to the, to the arts. Right. <laughs> oh, great. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I, 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 me being here is a good opportunity to hear from you. Uh, so I'm not, I'm not intentionally trying to turn it around on you, but perhaps you can tell me, um, what are the things that, what are the barriers, what are the opportunities that you see? State primarily, um, and I suppose it's just like battle measures um, uh, or, or uh, other regional issues, certainly or other federal issues. But again, I'm particularly interested in state. Issues. But, you know, are, are there things that you wrestle with and say, if only the state did this, or if only the state didn't do this, uh, we would be able to move forward uh, more effectively? You help by, by giving me that feedback, you help unlock my mind to say, oh, we have a you know, constituency in Boulder uh, that we're just going at it. So that, frankly, I get overwhelmed for why you tell us. And so it's what I can hear. I, I bring you to the kind of sort of digest that information. Yeah, I think mean, it's probably nothing new uh, uh, for any city uh, or in the country. I think mean, both our biggest challenges, I think, are needing more money to grant to arts organizations and artists. So there's the financial part of it. And then, you know, I, I guess the big thing that we that we try to work with and are figuring it out and trying to do good work is DEI and dealing with, for lack of a better term, like hate speech against artists. And artists that are underserved do art and then the people that for whatever reason don't like that they they rebel in whatever way whether it's defacing a poster or protesting outside you know we have events where the uh what's it called the 
uh, parasol. Uh, yeah, they, they were out at the, an event I went to last week. And it's like, why do they have to be there? What a sad state of affairs. What is this? Oh, the parasol patrol. Yeah, 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 no, they're but awesome. But the need for them. The need for them. Right. Yeah. yeah, and this was just like a pop-up drag queen show in front of a courthouse on Pearl Street. It's the coolest thing. Like six different artists coming out and doing performances. And the parasol patrol had to be there. And, you know, I even witnessed some person walking past shouting homophobic statements to the, the person who was performing at the time. And it was so cool to see the Parasol Patrol there. And they didn't react because they knew that would just start a whole thing. They waited. And the crowd kind of dealt with it and told the guy to move along themselves. Mm -hmm. But it was, it was comforting in my mind to know that they were there, ready to deal with it. Mm -hmm. um, what is that? Uh, it volunteers that they're known for this because they act, uh, have umbrellas, rainbow umbrellas. Yeah, that they'll open up and actually use physically to shield oh, the, the people from being whatever. And it started at libraries where there were kids coming in to so story to make drag queens. And I think that it was, yeah, the original idea is shielding, shielding the kids from the like, oh, From the so adults. Well, yeah. Again, the, we need to more lists. Yeah, yeah and that's the thing. Yeah. So, <laughs> so where, does, where does the legislative part of that enter into this whole thing with the arts in terms of free speech? You know, there's any number of things I could bring up. You know, free speech comes to mind first. But, you know, is there any kind of legislative stuff happening around the arts and expression, creative expression? Well, especially when you let off with, you know, they're going to cancel the NEA. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <they're> <laughs> <laughs> National Endowment for the Arts. That's right. the point, Carl, if I could, you don't mind if I jump in and ask a question because. Um, our commissioners give a lot of advocacy emails. Yeah. Well, uh, unless they're smart, unsubscribe. <laughs> but, I mean, um, <laughs> but, you know, for instance, uh, CBCA is going to be working on increasing the state arts budget because we're 48th in the country in arts funding and they want to change that. And so if commissioners get an email like that and they think it's a valuable thing to be considered by you, what, how do you want to hear about that? And then what's your process for council to consider stuff? Yeah, so it would start off by having a policy statement that has us be supportive of funding for the arts. Uh, and I, I imagine that might get well with that kind of uh, vitality discussion. Um, I know that we're going to have support for some things. Like resolution, but um, currently you all can and are obviously supporting the request as it comes to you. you want our council to support, you want the city as a whole to support it, then let's get something with the policy statement that says the city supports you know, funding for the arts, um, and particularly maybe it's, it's, it's uh, particularly uh, supportive of um, funding that helps to uh, break down barriers, uh, as communities, but whenever, because of course that that is particularly an important aspect of it. Um, what, I, yeah, go ahead. I, just logistically, what would the process be for that? Us to come up with language and suggest it to you, at, or to go in front of the city council? Yeah. So logistically. Um, Council is about to adopt a policy statement by the so it's too late for that. They will be asked to revise it in February. So prior to that, I'm going to convene a uh, council, the intergovernmental affairs committee, and some of those four council members, probably in January, hopefully as soon as possible, so that we can change it. Council is going to be first to be first. If by then we can have a vision. Um, it just looks, for example, it's pretty short. It's really long, but there's position. This is part of the protect the city's ability to produce homelessness. We have one paragraph, and then we have three examples of ways that the city um, 
go forward. Um, so something along those lines, then it could be more in that drafted. You work together, you run by the commission, get your lesson, and then I say this is coming from the commission that proposal always has more impact. In fact, I think they would say they would ask me to run by the commission otherwise. Um, so I believe it would start off with that. But that would be the way to go. Then when you, next time you get a letter, which doesn't you get from both sides, you can say, I can I can reach in independently, or I can just take advantage of the city process to say the city um, uh, coordinate with me or have that coordinate with me and say, this seems to be in furtherance of Oklahoma City's position. Can we have a city communication data to support this? And you know, it could just be the city of Boulder sports it, maybe the mayor to sign on, what have you, whatever they find to be respect. And, and, and they say we need to reach out to Senator, uh, Senator Benberg, this is crucial on this, or we reach out to Congress and Goose, then we can do that. So that's a power of the policy statements are going to be the United States. So more information. And the big thing I, I like to think about, though, is how do we distinguish ourselves? And it sounds like the equity, equity component. I, I wouldn't, I have to imagine that's that's central to many parts of the commission, although maybe more so in Boulder. And so I'm already thinking about something that says, you know, yeah, all cities want money for the arts and great critical of the arts district. Uh, Boulder is a pioneer in this or leads in this or has this unique angle. So that's that's part of what I believe we want to have in this paragraph. You know, it literally could be a sentence, you know, Boulder is uniquely committed to so and so, or, or, or its programs has been designed to uniquely impact and support so and so as a community. Um, the greater we do that, the more, it's a, at the very least, let, let's just say Thomas Deuce has to speak, uh, or Senator Bennett has to speak on, on an issue, and we, if we've sent them a letter, they're able to say, my communities, for example, Boulder has the following. That's why, you know, they're finding that it has this impact, cultural impact, economic impact, inclusive you know, engagement, whatever it may be. That's not that impact. Perhaps that's more than we can expect in a strong state of positions. But maybe in addition to that, I'm already thinking about what is that message that we want to convey about Boulder's uh, unique role in it. Otherwise, it's still great to just sign on the letters and, and say, how can we support you? I'm not trying to diminish the value of that, but already if we want to have a bigger impact, just kind of own in the what makes this unique and why maybe we uh, deserve a, a special voice or a role. Yeah, I just want to get it, Caleb. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know. Yeah. 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 And speaking of that, of course, we're talking about funding for, for higher education, ultimately, um, uh, for, for the removal of that, which uh, I don't know. Uh, but, but one of the things this commission did, which I, I applaud, was that they supported the Colorado Shakespeare Festival, which is an entity, an independent entity that exists on the college campus. You talked about the labs specifically, which, you know, the city of, of Boulder, uh, they taxed themselves back in the 50s to donate that land. Yeah. To create the labs and bring in the economic vitality that that created. What type of town gown, what type of interactions are you having with the flagship campus of the University of Colorado? Yeah, I'm not part of the right. member uh, meeting with them. I think it's a, a comprehensive staff monthly and we can miss the and we can keep the But that's what we're going to do. Uh, uh, on a quarterly basis. Uh, so, Quite a close connection. I know we're talking about agenda topics, but we're quite close. I don't think it's everything I thought of. Um, if you feel there is going to be movement and discussion at the regional, state, or federal level, uh, one thing that we were starting to think, I don't have the same level, but it's just called policy snapshots. And what they do is, in a graphically interesting way, front, front back, it basically says, here's what we do. Here's the gaps that we have from doing it better or the barriers. And then maybe in the back, here are some things that we ask you to support. 
And it's it's an opportunity to get in front of policymakers and say, um, we know that you get busy in the session when we actually have to go in front of you, but in anticipation of it, we want to be thinking about this issue. And we've done that for the only issue we've done it. We've seen a homelessness, uh, issue zero, uh, transportation safety. We've done it on, on other topics at least. Um, so a lot of times across the department, it comes to don't just in that one department. Um, but in any case, that is a tool that at some point I want to think about. I can certainly share that with you. Maybe that's what you're seeing. Maybe say, oh, this would be good. Maybe there's, there's people who are in the world of funding or maybe other policies that impact their work that maybe we can share that with them. And go, oh, yeah, well, it's got a story. Or it's got a lead. And they go to the car from the car. And that's actually like build out things. Basically, short, succinct, and then maybe a, a bigger communication that is, is, is in anticipation of actual information. Or, or I, I was going to ask if, uh, if it does help to have, if you're looking at a policy, have co sponsors or you're talking with Boulder Chamber or the Economic Council or business leaders rather than living in a vacuum as an Arts Commission, saying the Arts Commission and the Boulder Chamber or this. This group of chambers are, are recommending this. The policy snapshot, yeah, yeah, absolutely. That, for example, on homelessness, we indicated that the collaborative that they work with nonprofits, companies, over county, and nonprofits. So that would be a good place to capture it. Another aspect of what I think is for us to be effective, of course, we do is we build a coalition. We occasionally have initiatives that Senator Pepper, I keep going back to him. So uh, we, we might say we need we ask to carry this bill, uh, but even he might say, "Great, right, find us who else is important." Uh, unless you have a really unique reason to say that this is all we can invent. So I'm sorry. Yeah, no problem. And we've got about eight minutes. This may be a little tangential to your role, but how much of an impact do you think me as an institution have on a conversation with the CEO? Because I have seen that it comes up over and over again that we are funding arts projects that are associated with CU that were like, why is CU not carrying class for this? Why is this on the city of Boulder to be paying for special projects that the dance department has at CU and it's not being done through the dance department to budget to the arts projects? You know, uh, if I had a question, one of the things I mentioned is that there's kind of targets that we can try to influence RGB, like students in general. Uh, and then there's partners that we do collaborate with. CU is more often than a partner that, like, I don't have a project, so I certainly don't go necessarily and try to take their policy. That doesn't mean you can't. Uh, can. In fact, just recently, I'm the only suspicion council said, could you say that we also need 50 counties to support more, not just the state? And, and I said, that's fine, but you know, that's not the role that staff usually plays. Because when you're talking about, it's almost like a partner level. But legislatures used to be talking about this. But it is used to be talking about this. University, a little more sensitive. Uh, not the city, I'm thinking out loud. Yeah. So it doesn't mean we can't do it. We'd have to be strategic in how we deploy that. You know? um, so maybe that's a potential role. Maybe that's one that are going to be addressable and say, do you counsel want to be more formally on the record of asking the university to increase its funding? Or is that kind of about, or is there more of a soft or less formal way to approach that? Or do we want like to build resistance if we put it in writing or that we capture it with the other camera? Right. Or it's better to like just nurture that relationship with Lori. Or whoever it may be to, to say, what's it going to take for the university to increase it? And, and by the way, here's the numbers. This is what we, this way, shows we need this. And if the university benefits by that much, this is So, you know, maybe have we done enough homework behind the scenes that doesn't require a more formal process? And I'd be happy to be involved in that. Say, that maybe we need this. So that could be a lost opportunity. Sure. So we talked about formal testing the affordable housing for arts degree is the key issue. Um, access to venues um, beyond another set of them. 
a sidearm in our community, even though the larger venue performing arts would be possible. There's just a lack of affordable venues. And then I think that on standards of education, I think down at the K 12 level, what we see arts sometimes stripped from K 12. And uh, a lot of the grants for funding is for arts to go in and provide that element of the, the, the A and C. Um, so there's uh, things that we can help. Well, I mean, but the education and the housing one, but there are things that uh, are the education governor just introduced this uh, budget. You might have seen that for the first time. Your proposal is how to end the gap that exists between how much education K 12 should be funded per the Constitution and what it currently is funded. So it's a huge amount of money that's I hope, imagine that it's going to be the school. And then and then on, on housing, uh, this is one of our big priorities of housing just uh, you probably know that we got involved in the uh, Senate Bill 213 and last year. And it's about the state saying we're gonna remove some barriers that cities impose on create uh, on built on allowing people to use it for property to build, whether it's big duplexes or accessory dwelling units. Or, and, or, and we're going to make them have more density by transforming four year transit point areas. And they had a lot of benefits. It was an equity issue, it was climate, it was pollution, uh, but it was also very poor and affordable housing element. And so we are again making that work for priorities. So it's not targeted towards artists so much as, although it's good to hear being reminded that that is one of the challenges. It's not just more creative people starting artists. That's, yeah. It's not just it's not just permanent artists. Also, in Colorado, uh, the Aspen Music Festival has really shrunk because they can't afford to actually house for during the festival. Uh, Colorado Shakespeare Festival, Colorado Music Festival. Their biggest costs now suddenly are now the, the housing of the artists that are coming in to yeah. create the art for the city of Boulder from the summer. Well, luckily, I do think this this statewide systematic approach creates this art housing. Objection. It's supposed to be 15 minutes. Does anybody need that whole time, or can we take five minutes? To yeah, like back? May, I think Brenda can be fairly succinct. So if we want to get okay. him in first, and then we can be done with the business part of that. Oh, that okay? Let's do it. Okay. Let's do it. Yes. I think it's snappy. I don't. <laughs> Only if you saw the last side story. Yeah, I literally. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Should I, should I go without? Yeah. Um, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Carl. Thank you. All right, so just a couple items for public art business. Um, one is just, I will be tracking and updating public art projects and budgets um, in the public art implementation plan with help from the budget and planning offices and individual project managers for those specific projects. Um, and I'll report back at a later date. Um, I don't know, January? Yeah. Um, I'll try to have, I mean, again, it's sort of beholden to the timelines of these projects when budgets are allocated, um, but be sure that I'm tracking the departments and project managers for these public art projects. Um, some examples, um, a couple months ago, I presented the change to the Western City Campus project with an increased budget and extended timeline um, at the August commission meeting. Um, so I've been working with that team to compile an art selection panel. Maria has offered to serve on that. Um, so some of the other projects on the horizon are the Civic Area Phase 2, which was mentioned earlier today, and also the Pearl Street Mall Refresh, which will both have 1% for our budgets. Yeah, continue that, because um, I, I think a good perspective on this, the, the public art implementation plan is sort of writing a master plan on what's going to happen in the current course of a couple of years. Um, it's also sort of like the, what we just went through with the grants program of your opportunity to weigh in on projects, criteria, but in particular selection panel measures, say like, here's what you should be looking for because you use the, your recommendation to the city manager to approve the implementation plan as Brendan's uh, first approval to continue on the project. So we've got, you know, these steps in mind to kind of get Brendan to that point where he has what he needs for you to go out, talk to community members of the department, start spending any questions about public art implementation? Okay. So the one uh, thing I need a vote on is this delegation of authority for the standing selection panel. So I think most of you know that the per the public art policy, the standing selection panel is assembled to review and approve unique opportunities for public art. This is mainly for temporary experiments in public art projects, not permanent one percent projects. Obviously, um, also donations to the public art collection relocations of public art and the deaccession of public art. So for example, that, that artistic bike rack that was on Walnut, the standing selection panel reviewed that criteria, made a recommendation and I can to you all to present that. So um, all I really need today uh, for, for public art business is this motion, just delegate authority to the standing selection panel. And do you have a list of the existing panel? I don't. Um, Maria serves from the commission. Um, we also have Gabrielle Schuler, who is a uh, project manager at the city of Denver. She used to live in, in Boulder. Um, we have Nikki Eways, who's a uh, an event specialist and production designer, um, and Stephen Frost, who's a CU professor um, in media arts, and then Mark B. Real, who's a uh, past commissioner and is, is really active in the art circle. So that's our that's our panel. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Appreciate that. We're now meeting once a month. Yes. Um, we get updates from Brendan. It's supposed to be. I'll have issues with you and vote on the authority for unique opportunities, donations, relocation, family, sessions of public arts and states. I'll accept that. Further discussion? All in favor? That's it for me. Thanks. Wow. Glad later. Well, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. All right, now, <laughs> with the nod from Matt, uh, we had 15 minutes for the break schedule. Um, if, is there any objection to just keeping that at five minutes and just continuing on and try to make us a little bit of time? Perfect. Great, let's do that, five minutes. Do you want to with Kate, are we adjourning the business part of the meeting? We are. Oh. Yeah, that, so Great. that we are adjourning the business part of the meeting. And then we'll, after the break, continue on with our retreat. So as we begin break, I had this sneaky plan that I'm just realizing was probably a concern. I was going to remove the table and place it with couches. Oh. With that yeah. thing that you all went to. Yes. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. I love Objections. it. Objections. Okay. No, no objections. Especially these chairs. Okay. Pick a great part. <laughs> 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 Thank <laughs> you.
<laughs> the council has never done that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I mean, Amy, the first thing I do is fix splitting this. Um, Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. And then you have a little of everything. A little bit of everything. Not that. Yeah. The time for fiscal sponsorship. I mean, I.